nine on life origins. The caption here is life in the primordial soup. And uh, one of the jellyfish is saying to the other one, Earl, something's out there. And it's got a backbone and a complete digestive system. Well, we are not there yet quite. Okay, sorry, there's something on the, on the underside of this. There we go. How the heck do bacteria fossilize? Well, in some cases, they change the chemistry of the sediments. And so you get kind of a secondary idea that they were there. And in some cases, if the sediments are extremely smooth, there are actually microscopic bacterial traces in these ancient, ancient, ancient sediments. But uh, this particular one is an interesting story because it has some local connections, so I want to tell you this story. Many years ago, there was a geologist in Minnesota studying what are, were called stromatolites, these weird round blobs that were in the sediments from ancient times uh, in the surf zone. Because the surf zone sediments accumulate and become sedimentary rock as well. And he was trying to come up with ways that minerals could um, precipitate out of the surf and form these blobs, and he couldn't come up with anything that worked. So he goes on vacation. He goes to Australia. And he's going to snorkel on the Great Barrier Reef. Well, to snorkel on the Great Barrier Reef, you've got to walk into the water where the Great Barrier Reef is. And as he's walking into the water, he's stepping over these things. He's looking down like, okay, I guess I, I guess I can figure out what forms these. They're still being formed. He had no idea that they were still being formed on the planet because he only knew them from you know, billions of years ago. And so he asked people, and it turns out, these are prokaryotic groupings. The prokaryotes get together, they pull minerals out of the water, that's how it precipitates, as a protective uh, environment for themselves. So this was a type of prokaryote fossil. Pretty big, pretty obvious one. Now, between campus here and Saratoga, if you go up 29, there's a little left turn you can take that goes to the, I think they call them the petrified gardens or the fossilized gardens, but these are the sorts of fossils that are there. They don't look like much, but they are, in a way, the most ancient, clearly recognizable fossils of living things that you can find almost anywhere on the planet, which is kind of a cool thing to have locally. So we go from a planet of prokaryotes to cells getting bigger, cells getting more complex, infoldings of membrane becoming, honest to goodness, membrane um, in chambers, special chamber for the DNA processing, the nucleus, and probably the biggest advance is the ability to incorporate other cells to do stuff for you. So a bunch of things made eukaryotes kind of big deals. One of them that makes them different from prokaryotes is to have not just one set of DNA, but two sets of DNA, paired chromosomes, right? Homologous chromosomes. That sets the stage for sexual reproduction. There's a bunch of single-celled eukaryotes that recombine their genetics, uh, either with partners or by themselves, and produce offspring that are genetically different. Remember, that's a really big deal for evolution. Integrating aerobic respiration organelles, mitochondria, 
photosynthesis organelles, chloroplasts, like we saw in the lab. Those were really big chloroplasts. Chloroplasts typically are a little smaller than that. But they were nice and big and visible. A really, really big deal. Uh, and of course, the next, the really big deal. Oops, there would be if I could spell. Prokaryotes don't form colonies much. Those stromatolites are sort of colonial, but they're, uh, the cells are all pretty much doing the same thing. Remember, colonial groupings, the cells get together, and some of them do one job, and some of them do another job, and some of them do yet another job to support the whole group. And the only reason they're not multicelled is that they can all live on their own if they have to, but they're not good at it, and under natural conditions, they form these groups. So it's just a, a hop and a skip to multicellularity, which is what you find in eukaryotes. So time goes by, and time goes by, and time goes by, and time goes by. And then, looking at the fossil record, you get a whole bunch of recognizable modern groups of multicelled animals. The plants, not so much. The plants were still fairly simple, float on the ocean, algae. But the animals suddenly just appeared in many, many, many forms. I'm not going to write it down yet because of something I'll tell you in a second. There's a really great fossil bed in uh, southwestern Canada, just above Montana, uh, the Burgess Shale. Uh, it was a shallow inland sea. And uh, the sediments were really soft and, and, uh, and moldy, so they not only, uh, not only did hard parts preserve, but a lot of soft parts preserved. And there were a lot of weird animals, but also animals that were recognizably um, modern groups. Uh, this is a relative of ours. That would be a chordate. This would be a chordate. This is an arthropod. This is, they think, an arthropod. This one, they don't even know whether this is right side up or not. Uh, sponges. Um, there would have been, I'm not sure what those are, but virtually all of the modern animal phyla, the big phyla, have relatives in this group from the Cambrian era. And they called this appearance of animals the Cambrian explosion. That didn't happen all at once. It happened over you know, a few million years, but that's in the, the, the length of time of billions of years of the Earth, that's pretty doggone quick. And the question was, why? Where the heck did they come from? Nothing happened for a really long time, and then suddenly this happened. And now we get to another one of those stories. Another geologist studying um, sedimentation of, of a period, a decent amount, a little bit before the Cambrian explosion. And uh, he's... Of course, sedimentary rocks used to be sediments on the bottom of the ocean. And so he's looking at these layers from long ago, and he's seeing these big granite rocks. And he goes, okay, uniformitarianism. Okay, if I was looking at sediments on the bottom of the ocean, I'd know exactly what these were. These are iceberg drops. What does that mean? Well, when glaciers come across the continent, they're like big plows, and they push and grind up the, the rocks and stuff in front of them and actually integrate it into the ice as these huge rocks become part of the ice. You see them around here. You go hiking up in the, uh, in the Adirondacks. You see these huge rocks that were just dropped by glaciers as they um, melted back. Well, the ones that reach the ocean, big chunks break off and become icebergs, and a lot of these have these rocks integrated into them. And they drift out, and they gradually melt, and they drop the, the, the rocks and they embed themselves in the sediments, but they don't match the sediments around them. They're very foreign rocks, and that's what he's looking at. Okay, cool enough. Except these sediments he's looking at were formed in the tropics, right in the middle of the planet on the equator. So he wrote a paper about this going, something weird happened. Iceberg's not supposed to get that far south. They melt long before they get there. Something was weird. And of course, the first reaction was, well, okay, you've screwed this up. 
we know that the continents and everything move around slowly. So just because what you're looking at is on the equator today doesn't mean it was on the equator these hundreds of millions of years ago. Anyone? I'm pretty sure I'm not wrong about this. Let me look at other things. And it turns out that the sediments give you a way of telling where they were when they formed. It has to do with the orientation of the magnetic field. So he did some other checking, and then he was able to come forth and go, no, these formed on the equator. And there were still floating icebergs on the equator. It was really cold. And then people started to go, hmm. You know, we've been wondering why there was this period going into the Cambrian explosion where the sediment accumulation was really low. You just weren't getting the same sort of, of layering and thickness of the layering in the sedimentary rock from those sediments. A big ice age reduces the outflow that carries the sediments out into the ocean, reduces the outflow and would reduce the sediments. And then they started to look at this stuff and they started to look much more closely. And they came up with this. You know these guys were Americans. I don't think anybody other than Americans would name it this. But Snowball Earth. They eventually figured out this was not just a little ice age. This was the biggest ice age the Earth has ever had. Is that eventually, it wasn't just icebergs on the equator. The oceans were frozen on the equator. Is that in places the oceans were frozen down as much as uh, half a mile. So... You're looking for a big change to get into the Cambrian explosion? You want to talk about changes in conditions, kind of pushing evolution forward? This would have been a huge change. There would have been ecosystems. Surf zones wouldn't have frozen as much. Hydrothermal vents, some of which are close to the surface, would have, would have stayed liquid. But the usable real estate for, the life, for life on the planet would have been reduced to a highly competitive small number of places and the kind of la di da kind of really slow evolution that happens when conditions don't change suddenly got this humongous shove and within a couple of million years at places probably away from where the evolution was happening where they eventually migrated to you got the Cambrian explosion all of these new animals with teeth and shells and defenses that they probably developed in trying to survive in these limited ecosystems during this major, major, very long ice age. Plant eventually, the planet eventually melted down, probably from volcanic eruptions and greenhouse gases, eh, global warming, not always a bad thing, uh, back then. And uh, the plants didn't really do much advancing because they were still in the ocean they, you know, any place where the ocean was still liquid, they were able to survive. So the animals became really new and different, but the plants really didn't. So the Cambrian explosion was just animals. And then from then on, the animals, you know, across the whole planet once the planet was, was uh, thawed out. And so layer after layer after layer of, of animals from the oceans. That's what you find mostly around here, is that um, the last time that New York was uh, largely underwater was, uh, was back b before there was a major move of animals onto land. Uh, so the last time sedimentary rock was deposited here the, to be found millions and millions of years in the future, uh, the, the major animals were, uh, were crustaceans and trilobites, which are kind of sort of crustaceans. And so the sedimentary rock around here, uh, you're not going to find a lot of dinosaur bones. Is that dinosaur remains uh, are very unusual uh, over here because when the dinosaurs were around in New York, uh, if, if we transported you back to New York and you looked around, you'd go, well, you missed. I'm in Colorado. Because it would have looked like you were in the Rocky Mountains. These little mountains around here used to be really big. Not a lot of sedimentation being formed. You know, there were some lakes. You do find some dinosaur footprints and you know, a couple of dinosaur fossils on, uh, in the Northeast. But not a lot because it was a very bad 
place to form fossils when the dinosaurs were around. But so the Cambrian explosion happens, and then a good quarter of a billion years goes by before, and, and all of the sediments uh, show just animals that lived in the oceans. But eventually, we know animals were able, and plants were able to move onto the land. To, to move around on the land, you've got to be able to hold yourself up. So support was a really major issue. Um, oh, this is terrible. I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to send you to the book because I'm drawing a complete blank on, on uh, these things. Um, you're being exposed to direct sunlight that the water would have protected you from. That's a really big deal what they call photooxidation. Also, oxygen doesn't dissolve in water all that well, and over the course of a couple of billion years, it has been accumulating in the atmosphere. The atmosphere around us has got way more oxygen in it than oxygen can dissolve in the water. That's why animals that, of groups that have become land animals, when they go back into the water, they don't breathe it, because there's not enough oxygen in there to support their the metabolism they developed as land animals. So oxygen is a really, really big deal. Um, reproduction, sexual reproduction in water is relatively easy because you, the sperm can swim to where the egg is. On land, Sperm don't fly. Well, they do now. Pollen grains have sperm in them. But being able to reproduce without having to go back into the water, which is what amphibians have to do, to be able to inject the sperm into the female or fly it one way or another to the female parts of a plant, which is what the plants eventually did with pollen, uh, was a really, it, it took a long time. That was the very last of the problems to get solved by land animals and land plants. Um, the animals weren't going to really colonize the, the land until the plants were there as the bottom of a food chain. And the plants couldn't get onto land without a source of uh, nitrates, which is how they make amino acids and proteins. So remember, everything runs on proteins. Well, plants don't have access to nit nitrogen uh, unless we give it to them. Or they have little buddies who pull nitrogen out of the atmosphere. The atmosphere's got a lot of nitrogen in it. And can fiddle with it to make nitrates. And then the plants can make amino acids and make proteins. And they give the, these little buddies, both bacteria and funguses, a very nice place to live and they give them food. And that's how plants were able to colonize the land. They took these symbionts with them and still, most of the plants you see around you could not survive without their, uh, their not, what they call nitrogen-fixing symbionts to, uh, to get them by. Now, the list is a little longer than this uh, because I, I literally am drawing a blank on, on some of the stuff. Uh, so you're going to have, if I ask you about this, and I probably will, you've, you've got to look this up. And obviously, drying out was a big deal. There's another one. So you don't just move out of the ocean up onto the land. There are some places where, if you can live there, a lot of the adaptations you need to get you by will work in the air as well as in the water. And the two major staging areas Tidal pools. The tide comes in, the tide goes out, it leaves pools behind. The pools dry up. You need to be able to get from one pool to another. Support becomes an issue, being able to travel in the air. 
It rains into the pools. Evaporation happens. The water levels, diffusion, osmosis change, is that you need to be able to deal with differences in water levels. And that's something that, remember, animals primarily do that by waterproofing to keep the water from coming in from the fresh water, uh, the rainwater. And if once you're waterproofed, you're not losing it to the air either. So that's a pre-adaptation uh, to the air. Uh, fresh water, the same way. You keep the water from coming in, it keeps the water from going out. Is that being able to scramble around in moving water, you have to have better support systems. So animals that could adapt to tidal pools already needed some of the machinery to get up into the land more permanently. Same thing with shallow fresh water. Oh, another thing. See, I'm starting to remember more stuff here. So this added here. Water doesn't change temperature very quickly, but air does. Temperature fluctuations have a huge effect on chemistry. We talked about enzymes. And animals in a tidal pool, there's not a lot of water there to, to protect you from tidal fluctuations. Fresh water, rainwater, changes the temperature. The rainwater comes down at the temperature of the air, floods through the water. You better be able to deal with temperature fluctuations. So your chemistry has got to be what they call more robust, is that your enzymes have got to be able to deal with a bigger uh, change in temperatures. Now, it's true that the, probably the first animals were coming out and the first plants coming out in the tropics, so it wouldn't have been huge temperature fluctuations, not like we have around here. But eventually, you need to be able to do that kind of all over the planet. Okay, I will come back. Great moments in evolution. Suddenly, Bobby felt very alone in the world. Sorry, extinct, extinct, extinct. That's the next, the last thing I want to talk about for this chapter. And I'm going to give you a list you're going to need to copy down. There are periods in the fossil record where there's stuff, and then in the next layer, the newer layer, a whole bunch of that stuff is gone. A whole bunch of those species are not there anymore. And if better than 50% of the species in this layer have disappeared in the next newer layer, that's considered a mass extinction, a 50% threshold. What makes that happen? Well, most of us are familiar with the great extinction of the dinosaurs. That was an asteroid impact. Big rock came in from space, hits just the wrong spot on the planet, sends a whole bunch of dust up into the atmosphere. Here's the, the one common thread in mass extinctions. You want to kill off most of the animals, those are the ones that are mostly in the fossil record, take out most of the plants. And so anything that will take out most of the plants will give you a mass extinction. Screening off the sun is a big one, right? Asteroid impact, mass volcanoes, is that at one point in the, the mid-dinosaurs there was a mass extinction and almost all of what's now India were just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of active volcanoes and Siberia at another period. And they put, spew a bunch of stuff into the atmosphere that, uh, that screens off the sunlight and kills a bunch of the plants. Ice ages, like snowball periods, can cause mass extinctions. Uh, those are the, the, the primary you know, impacts, volcanoes, ice ages. Uh, sometimes people go, oh, diseases, no. In order for a disease to for it cause a mass extinction, it would need to take out all the plants. And there's the, plants don't all die from the same diseases. They're like animals. There's, you know, diseases tend to be specific to groups of plants. So you're not going to get rid of the plants through diseases. You're not going to get rid of the animals through diseases. Also, diseases tend to evolve to get milder. Is that 
not in their interest to wipe out their hosts. They want their hosts not just alive, but up and spreading their offspring, spreading the, the disease organism's offspring. So diseases are not going to be a, a, a way to do mass extinctions. Okay, that is it for this particular chapter.